Good evening, BC. James Griffiths, uh, the Vinyl Professor, uh, doing a nighttime video for you. This is a Pink Floyd special. I'm going to be doing uh, a countdown of my uh, least favourite to favourite Pink Floyd album. Um, I've never done one of these videos before. Uh, I bow down before the undisputed master of the genre, that's Joe, me, Mr. Mayo. Never ceases to amaze me how well he does it. I've often wondered, could I do it? Could I rank albums according to how much I like them? I thought I'd give it a try. I'm going to do it with Pink Floyd. Um, so just before I start, there's no Pink Floyd album that I don't enjoy at least part of. So all these records, there are some tracks on all of them that I like. So there's no Pink Floyd album that I outright dislike. So I've done my best, given that, to rank them. It hasn't been that hard, not as hard as I was expecting. Let's make a start. Um, the My least favourite Pink Floyd album, I'm afraid, is this one. The Division Bell. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of the Floyd after Roger Waters left. I think they lost a lot of their lyrical edge. And um, I think the band under David Gilmour strayed into uh, almost sort of middle of the road kind of music. The Division Bell is a good example of that. I mean, you've got High Hopes, which is a, you know, a really good song. Uh, you've got Pearls Apart, which is good. Coming Back to Life, no, um, Keep Talking, which is okay. But overall, um, it missed the magic of Pink Floyd for me, generally. Number 11, I'm afraid, also for fans of Post Roger. I'll not be happy with this. This is Momentary Lapse of Reason. I like it slightly better than The Division Bell. Um, it's a bit rockier, if anything. The Division Bell is it, just too kind of meandering. At least this had some balls, you know. Um, this is an original press from 1980, was it 87? bought it when it first came out. There's some naff tracks on it, you know, the Dogs of War on the Turning Away. Side 2 is quite weak. Um, I quite like Learning to Fly, quite like One Slip, which is a co-write with uh, Phil Manzanera, isn't it? But again, it's not, it's not vintage Floyd for me. Number 10 is this album, Oma Gumma. Um, not sure what pressing this is. It's not an original press, but it's quite an old one. Reasonably battered. Bought it from a charity shop a few years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not known as the Floyd's best work, really. Uh, the um, the second half of the album, where they where they all do their own songs, is 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 really self indulgent. I mean, Richard Wright's Sisyphus is a bit pretentious, really, isn't it? But um, Grantchester Meadows is a nice track, and The Narrow Way by David Gilmour is alright. Uh, I quite like the live stuff, Astronomy Domain, careful with that axe, Eugene, you know, quite, quite good performances. This is actually my favourite Floyd cover. Number nine, we have Atom Heart Mother, an album which... Um, has a great big kind of idea behind it, <laughs> great big um, melodic idea, but it, it wasn't terribly well executed and I think it's it's now seen by the band themselves as a bit of a period piece. I know it's got it's, it's kind of got its supporters on the VC, uh, but it's not one that I play very often. Uh, again, great cover. Um, this was where the band were trying to find their way really, I think, after Sid Barrett's uh, have been shown the door and they were they were struggling to find a direction. Some reasonably nice moments, but um, they haven't quite got it yet. <clears throat> okay, number eight is this album, the final cut. Quite an unpopular album amongst um, segments of you know Pink Floyd fandom. This was the album where Roger Waters just completely took control of the band. Um, Rick Wright had been shown the door, he was no longer part of the group. Nick Mason had been relegated to, uh, well, I mean, he did do some sound effects for this album, but he was now just basically the drummer. 
and David Gilmore um, was just reduced to being a session guitarist really. Uh, I quite like some of the songs and I think it does work well as an album, as a kind of concept album. It sort of tells a story. Um, if it was by a different band it would be much higher up the list because I do, I do like it as an album but it's, it's not like a, a great Pink Floyd album. Number seven is an album that I do actually really like. This is uh, Source Full of Secrets. This is the reissue that came out uh, this year, actually. Um, the album where, uh, I mean, Sid Barrett is on here a little bit, isn't he? He's on, um, he does a bit of slide guitar on Remember a Day. Uh, there's a good atmosphere to this album. It's a kind of early psychedelic piece, really. Um, it's a bit lacklustre on the production side. It was produced by Norman Smith, and uh, he was a kind of engineer at Abbey Road, and he, he didn't really believe in the band. He didn't really believe in them after Sid left, I don't think, and uh, it lacks sonic clarity, I think, and bite. Um, but it is an album I'm fond of. At number six is possibly one of their big magnum opuses. This is The Wall. This is probably a first press. I had it for Christmas in 1979. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not higher up the list because I think with The Wall, Roger Waters certainly appropriated Pink Floyd and turned them into a kind of quite a strident, I, I almost can I say one dimensional kind of vehicle for his concerns, you know. Having said that, I think it, it, it's possibly the Floyd's best sounding record. I know some people would say Dark Side of the Moon, but I find Dark Side of the Moon quite airless. There's kind of so much going on. Whereas The Wall, I mean, The Wall is a brilliant sounding record. Um, you know, a huge amount of depth to the sound, huge amount of clarity, and some great playing as well. I mean, you know, David Gilmore, Uncomfortably Numb. Um, and Run Like Hell. Uh, I mean, it's a grand conceit. And there are some great tunes and great words, but it's just got that kind of strident edge to it, which makes it, um, you know, it's not an easy listen. And th th I think there are certainly places where it becomes very self-indulgent. The next one we're going to have at number five is Animals. It's starting to get a bit harder now as we go further up the list, because I do really like these albums. Um, Animals is a great album. Uh, it's really raw, it's really impassioned, it's got a lot of political belief in there. And you've got to hand it to the band at this stage, because punk had broken big, you know, and so many bands were f kind of falling down and, and completely failing to move with the times. And Floyd, even though, you know, Johnny Rotten was famous for wearing that t-shirt, I, I hate Pink Floyd. Oddly enough, Pink Floyd were one of the few bands from that era who really rose to the plate. Stepped up to the plate, rose to the challenge, and produced an album which is kind of searing in its indictment of certain political realities, you know. Uh, I mean, it has a pop at Mary Whitehouse, it has a pop at Thatcher. No, it's Mary Whitehouse, isn't it? It definitely has a pop at the kind of, you know, mid-1970s capitalist kind of regime. <clears throat> And it's just a fantastically bleak record. It's not higher because, again, it's got that Roger Waters kind of stridency to it. And it's a bit self-indulgent in places. Uh, there's like long segments where you're kind of waiting for things to get going again. Um, but, I mean, she, um, yeah, Sheep is a phenomenally fantastic track with that Rick Wright keyboard introduction and the amazing fade out on the guitar, Dave Gilmore. It's an album I really, really like, Animals. Okay, so, I mean, it's starting to get really hard now. At number four, I've got Wish You Were Here. Uh, if you ask me on another day, you know, I might put that top. Uh, um, I love the sound of it. I love the playing on it. I love the atmosphere on it. Uh, but it is, it is very bleak. It's a bleak album. You know, Welcome to the Machine. I don't want to say anything bad about it. It's Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. I mean, I think Rick Wright said it best. He said, you can have a glass of wine, 
you can put this album on and it kind of takes you somewhere, which is what the kind of classic Pink Floyd thing always was, wasn't it? You know, from their kind of early psychedelic roots. It was meant to be astral music originally, off into the stars. They'd lost that by this point, but it was still music to lead yourself to. And um, I love the cover. The inside picture of the red of the red veil blowing in the um, in the field. I love that picture. I'd like a print of that, really. That's wish you were here. Number four. So we're down to the last three. What do you reckon? Number three. Medal. Um, yeah, it's got one of these days on it, which is one of the, the most fantastic kind of space rock tracks ever. It's got uh, Pillow of Winds, which is beautiful, Fearless, which is a fantastic song. It's got a couple of throwaway tracks on it, saint and Seamus, but then of course side two, you've got Echoes, which arguably is the moment where Pink Floyd really started to find their own identity that kind of long drawn out symphonic thing, you know, moving through all these movements. Great lyrics as well. This is the album where Roger Waters' lyrics really started to kind of home into focus, really. And uh, I think people started to realise that uh, Pink Floyd were going to be a, quite a serious band um, with a, a kind of lyrical focus and outlook, which, which was going to distinguish them from a lot of their peers. <clears throat> and... Uh, Metal was the album, I think, where Roger Waters finally started to realise that he had he had something to say and he was working out how to say it uh, and it was just going to be a case of refining it, which of course he did. OK, so we're down to the last two. What do you reckon? At number two we have The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. I've always loved this album. I love Sid Barrett. I love his songs. I mean, really, I could make a whole video about this. Such an original songwriter, such an original visionary artist, I would say. Um, if, if, if a few of the songs from his first solo album had been on this instead of the instrumentals on here, I don't mind um, Interstellar Overdrive, but it does go on rather a long time. But there's, a, there's a couple of other tracks on side one which are not amazing. There's... Power Talk H isn't there, which is not great. And there's Roger Waters' track, Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk, which is not great either. If they'd replaced those with the Barrett tracks, actually either of the singles would have been great. If they'd had um, See Emily Play and uh, Arnold Lane instead of those two, then I think it would have been a truly first-class, incredible album. It is a first-class, tr tr truly incredible album. Um, but I've I've always thought it'd be nice if it could have been a Sid album all the way through, but definitely one of my all-time favourite records. I'm sorry to be so predictable. I tried, I really tried not to be predictable, but I went with number one, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, this album has its detractors. There are people who don't like it, there are people who don't rate it. Uh, I can I can kind of see where they're coming from. This is not a first press, but it is from 1973. This was my dad's copy, which he bought in the early 70s. Um, there wasn't time here, is there, to discuss Dark Side of the Moon. It just is what it is. Um, it's an incredible lyrical achievement, I think, by Roger Waters. It's got some fantastic playing on it, fantastic guitar solos from... David Gilmore, it's got some great drumming from Mick Mason, uh, his Tom Tom stuff that he does on time. And I like the I like the atmosphere, the technology as well, the synthesizers, you know, the early synths, the sound effects on brain damage, and just the way the whole thing builds and becomes one big long piece and you know carries you away. It's just a a kind of landmark record, isn't it? It's like Sgt. Pepper, it's like Revolver, it's like um um, yeah, well, yeah, it's not like that many other things, is it? It's Dark Side of the Moon. It's a fairly unique record. I wanted to put it somewhere else, not at number one, but ultimately I couldn't really have it anywhere else except at the top of the list. Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. 
for me, an absolute masterpiece. And um, yeah, that concludes my Pink Floyd from 12 to 1, least favourite to favourite. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye.